Hotep. I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore, Peace host and producer of OmniU Presents the H3O Art of Life show. The title of this show is Family Matters, Death in the Family. At this time, we're hearing a lot and seeing a lot of things going on having to do with various cemeteries and various practices con having to do with uh, death-related issues. I thought it was time for us to confront some of this, and I have a lot of questions, and so I want to ask my questions of people who have uh, access to the answers even if they may not have all of the answers themselves. I'm not going to put the onus on them to know everything, but certainly they know how to find everything that I want to know. And I want to introduce my guest. I want to start with Raymond Akins, Thank you. Who is a funeral director. And then I want to go to Monica Gray, Thank who is you. secretary of the Illinois Funeral Association, Funeral Directors Association, and you're going to give all the particulars of that title sure. when it's your turn. And then, of course, Juan A. Saber Murdy Gentry, who is with the SIA Foundation. Yep. And, of course, he's not a funeral director, but he is very, very knowledgeable in the question of death-related issues. And so he is here to bring the spiritual side of this, this whole um, issue. I want to say that I have one question that has not been answered by anybody, and I'm not sure if you can answer this question. It's, it may even be rhetorical at this point, but of course we saw all of the things in the newspaper about the things going on at Burr Oak, and I have a vested interest in that because I have very dear loved ones in that cemetery. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I noted it was that they continued to talk about the number of bones that were being found, the remains that were being found, but they were never talking about the burial containers or the caskets. And it seems to me that wherever there is someone interred in a grave, there has to be a burial container by law, and there has to be a casket. So I'm wondering where all of these uh, objects are which would have to be numerous because they are talking about hundreds of, of uh, graves that have been desecrated. Have you heard or have you considered what possibly might have become of those containers? They look at each other <laughs> and I thought it might be no. rhetorical. No, well my first response was, was going to be if they were uh, in the ground a sufficient amount of time, the metal could easily have disintegrated into the, into the soil. Uh, I'm not, uh, I only know about Baroque what I read in the paper, mm -hmm. and um, supposedly there were the remains of, you know, the, uh, the boxes, the concrete boxes that, are, you know, encased the casket. Uh, pieces of that were found around the property, but beyond that I can't give uh, uh, any specific answer uh, right. to your question, well, only that if you've seen anything metal that's been in the ground for a number of years, given the passage of time, it'll mm -hmm. tend to uh, uh, worn, worn or but we back would into see, the elements. We would see some <laughs> remnants. We would see, I would think, a sufficient Chrome, amount of remnants uh, to uh, make uh, uh, a noticeable um, make noticeable refuse it just seems to me and I because I'm guessing that would be part of the investigation too on the part of the Cook County Sheriff that's probably questions one of the questions maybe that they ask and maybe they're trying to look into that as well well it's it's uh, it's hard to get the answers for some of these things that come to mind but I think that in terms of, of um, death in the family and death is always in the family yes you know it in terms of uh, no one ever dies alone there's always someone somewhere who has who is related to that person who cares or did care at some point in time about that individual it's and a community event it, yes it is and so we have to be concerned about matters pertaining to death and we cannot wait to concern ourselves when the death actually occurs we have to concern ourselves for about these issues because they are ongoing they are ultimate they are not going to go away so I wanted to just let us walk through 
some of the things that happen upon the passing of an individual. I know that, you know, there have to be arrangements. And what kinds of things do people typically experience when they begin to deal with uh, death, whether it is already anticipated or whether it's sudden, as is so often the case uh, yeah, in I our community. So often we are caught completely <clears throat> unaware that this possibility uh, could occur. So what sort of things um, are the first steps or the first things, the first experiences that, that people undergo, family members undergo when they have a death in the family? Stop looking at each other. You both know the answers. <laughs> well, there's a lot of emotional issues going mm -hmm. on. Maybe the anger and the maybe bargaining with God. You know, if it, if it wasn't a surprise, maybe somebody was sick. You, mm -hmm. know, you know, if you make my mom well and my dad well, I'm going to go to, you know, to worship from now on. I'm going to do this or that. So mm -hmm. it's a range of emotions that take place there. And Sometimes it's kind of too late, though, if you don't have insurance at that point, because insurance is contestable for the first two years. The policy, you know, the insurance company can... What are you saying? Insurance is contestable? If you buy a brand new policy, okay. people don't, may not realize that the first two years, it can be contested by the insurance company if you die within the first two years. Of, of acquiring the because policy. Because they'll give you a questionnaire and you'll say whether you smoke or not, or, you know, are you... How much do you weigh? All the questions that they ask you on the questionnaire, mm -hmm. you know. And if somebody dies within that two years, the insurance company may question it, and then they'll have to pull your medical records. And then if they find anything in the medical records that they felt should have been disclosed in the application, then they won't pay the face of the policy. Yeah, that's the you'll probably the get your premiums. Have. Yeah. You'll get your premiums back, but you won't get the face yeah. amount of the policy. I don't know if people really understand that. When they think I'm, I got this policy, you know, this is, it is a step in the right direction, but. Well, I think right time, really. in, in assuming that there are uh, a, a number of people in our community who are either underinsured or uninsured. I say definitely that would be the case uh, say these days. Uh, Monica, you may, uh, you, maybe you can back me up on this, but uh, if we had to say what the average amount of a policy is at the time of death that a family might bring to a funeral home, generally it's less than 5000 Would that be correct? Yeah, sometimes if they bought the policies maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. that's what the amount is. Mm -hmm. 1000 2000 right. In but the old days, it was $250 right. or $500. Right. Those exactly. were the old burial insurance. And burial I have insurance. read recently yeah. that the average adult funeral is about sixty-three hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. right. I say so. If you're coming in with a policy a shortfall of less than sixty-three hundred dollars, then you already are in difficulty with trying to complete the arrangements. So, what is done for people who are underinsured or uninsured? Because obviously, something has to be done to to uh, take care of this matter. I think those are very good questions because, and it they occurs are. more often, um, I, you really, you know, you're knocking them out the park, I guess you could say. Um, there is, af there is a, a lack of sufficient resources to have the kind of funeral, let's say, a family would like to have. And the question is, how is that made up? Sometimes they go amongst other family members and try and raise the money themselves. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, they may, if they have a, a credit card or mm -hmm. if they're able to borrow money, like from a bank or what have you, uh, uh, or sell an asset, they'll do something like that. But in any case, um, I, it's a very complex issue because I think what you may be getting at is, and if I'm wasting the head, let me know, but if you've only got 5000 right. then don't spend no more than 5000 on the funeral. Mm -hmm. And yet you say funerals are six and 7000 mm -hmm. when the question becomes, do they have to be that amount? Could Aren't you, there could some built-in costs, though? Aren't there some costs that cannot be uh, evaded uh, if you're going through a, a funeral home? Uh, aren't there certain costs that, that are just, just come with the territory? I think you'd be talking about the non-declinable the non basic service charge. Yeah. Of the and the non-declinable basic service charge is how much? 
generally speaking? It varies speaking. by mm -hmm. funeral home. It depends yeah. on the funeral home. Okay, what could, what's to, the range? I'd say 1500 to 2000 probably okay. for just walking in the door and having the privilege of sitting down making arrangements with the, uh, the funeral home. You'll probably expect to see that. Um, very few these days are under 1000 so okay. I, in, yeah. at so the low end would be maybe nine to 1200 generally i would say 15 to 2000 okay. 1500 to 2000 so you have to have some money just to be just to get the 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 arrangements started just to begin the the arrangements and then add it to this 1000 or 1500 dollars approximately becomes then we're adding now the casket. Mm -hmm. Where, uh, what else are we adding? Let me just say in principle that that basic service fee is not, um, we say it's for the privilege of coming into the funeral home and making the arrangements, but by design it's, it's the aim is to recapture the operating overhead exactly. of the funeral, the funeral home, the staff, the insurance, uh, the maintenance, uh, you know, the, the total overhead, let's say, of a business, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, well, one way of, uh, uh, of arriving at that basic service fee would be to, like, take your, your annual operating costs, mm -hmm. divide by the number of funerals, and you come into a, a figure that if you wanted to recapture all of your overhead, mm -hmm. uh, that, that figure per funeral would translate into into that and without recapturing your overhead you couldn't stay in business well that's <laughs> yes and and now we're moving into even I think uh, more complexity because generally the process of arriving at a basic service fee is to look into the past mm -hmm. obviously right to mm -hmm. see what your, your operating overhead is in the past that means that the the computation is also based on um, your experience, but if the economy or the economic environment shifts, or your taxes go way up, <laughs> yeah, a number of things could happen that'll make that overhead perhaps in some cases not be sufficient. Now, mm -hmm. what I'm talking about is a funeral home that's been historically in the African American community. We've always had what we call traditional bur burials. Mm -hmm. That's a casket, embalming awake in a service, there are limousines, there's ministers, mm -hmm. there's programs. That's what in the black community we would call a traditional service. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Non-traditional service on the other hand would be one where instead of a, uh, embalming the family might choose cremation and a memorial service. Mm -hmm. Well there's obviously less revenue. Now that's where you fall in, in terms of cost. You can go under 5,000, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. uh, and the question becomes from an operating standpoint, uh, does the funeral home still have the ability to recapture its, its theoretical overhead? Mm -hmm. and, and let me be maybe make it a little bit easier to understand. Uh, if you're operating a business and 90% or more of your volume, your services, are based on what we call traditional services. Mm -hmm. And then there occurs a shift where the less than 10%, let's mm -hmm. say maybe even 5% of your client base was non-traditional. It, when it goes from 5% to 30%, mm -hmm. you are definitely in a, a situation that can uh, threaten the survival of the firm. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does okay. make sense. And I think these are important things to know because we have to understand that there are at least three sides to death. One is personal, of course, for the, the, the person who expires, for the family members who, uh, who have to suffer with this loss, and of course the spiritual side, which is the side that we're going to spend some time talking about because, you know, we have to do more than just pass away. There's, a, there's some stuff that goes on called life Absolutely. before one gets to that point. And so there's some things that we need to consider about that. And then, of course, there's the business side. And we're talking about the business side because we don't get a chance to talk about the business <coughs> side until we're sitting in that chair across from that funeral director who is telling us, you know, what 
the the costs are for a traditional uh, funeral, which is as you say common in in our community, and we're we're coming up, we're coming to grips with the fact that we have X amount of dollars, but what we want to do probably exceeds X amount of dollars, and so we have the grief of the loss as well as the trauma of what are we going to do to show, pay a pro proper tribute and show the, the rest of the community our regard for our loved one. So, you know, here's the funeral director sitting on one side of the desk and he has a set of concerns and here are the family members on the other side and they have their concerns and of course the business side has to be handled in a business-like manner. Right. The, the, uh, the grief-stricken relatives cannot, be, uh, cannot afford to be any less business-like about this transaction than they would be about any other business transaction. That's just the cold, hard truth. So we're sitting here and now we're discussing the various kinds of things that are required. You, you, if you're going to have a traditional funeral, then you're going to have to have certain things. You're going to have to have embalming or cremation. Is that correct? A traditional funeral would generally involve embalming. Right. It will generally involve embalming. That's yes. a cost. Yes. Then yes, it uh, it's going to require a casket. That's yes. a cost. It's going to require a place for the service to be held. That's correct. If it is the funeral home, that's a cost. If it is a church, generally that's a donation, is that correct? Churches typically don't have a set of fees that they charge for funerals, do they? No, but from the uh, <coughs> standpoint of the funeral home, uh, you will have to use a vehicle to exactly. transport the deceased right. to the okay. church for the service, so there's a cost involved in going, okay. going so to church. So the vehicle is generally a limousine. Uh, well, a limousine, a but uh, to carry the body, the it would hearse. be a, a hearse. Okay, yeah, so, that's a cost. Uh, yes. All right. And then, of course, you have to go Programs, to the cemetery. Flowers, mm -hmm. Cemetery. To choose a burial plot. Mm -hmm. That's a cost. Yes. Then that burial plot has to have, it's interesting um, that you have, you don't really buy a grave, you buy real estate because you have to have, the, gr the grave has to be opened and it has to be closed. And then my question was when I went to attend to this matter, I said, what do you, how can it be a grave if it isn't open? You know, if you don't open it, it won't be a grave. That's well, great. as it turns out, the, it shouldn't be called one because it isn't a grave until it's opened and closed. And there's a fee for opening open and, closing. and closing. And there's a requirement, I'm told, that there be a container inside this grave to receive Absolutely. the casket. Yes. Yes. All of these are costs. Absolutely. And you've said funeral programs. Mm -hmm. Flowers. The flowers generally are sent by the family members and friends. So but there will always be uh, the piece that sits the on the casket. Spray what they call the spray or the spread, okay. All right. generally the family always gets it. Okay, mm -hmm. but that's not going to be added to the bill that's paid to the funeral home. Well, if, if you have the funeral home serve as your agent in ordering the piece, okay. then um, the, aid, the florist will expect to be paid by the exactly. funeral home. Okay. So the funeral home serves as the agent and collects okay. the money. So the, the funeral director is becoming more and more to me like a general contractor. I, because he's overseeing huh? all of these yeah. other businesses <coughs> that provide these various services. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's not you know it's that's not a bad thing, if you if you unless of course you could do some of these things yourself. I have seen casket stores, I've seen obituary stores. Um, we've always had florists in the community. Mm -hmm. Are embalming services available outside of a funeral home? Could you actually hire? You have to be a licensed um, Can you hire a licensed embalmer though to do, to provide that service? If to you come into somebody else's funeral home? They use, the funeral home has licensed embalmers on staff. So that you, you cannot do a funeral I, without a 
funeral I, home? I think what you may be getting at, yeah, let's mm -hmm. say in the case of um, uh, there's a movement like with green burials or people who are doing it, doing it themselves and not using a funeral home. A funeral director would be required to get, let's say, the death certificate. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to have a, a, a service at, outside of a funeral home, let's say at a church or a, a fraternal organization facility or what have you, and you wanted the body to be embalmed, you could buy the casket someplace else. You could find a service that does do embalming and you could pay, you could contract with that outfit to uh, prepare the deceased, mm -hmm. okay? So, but you would still need the funeral director to get the death certificate and... and um, you would need a hearse. Right. You can't rent hearses like you do limousines. Yes. You, you can. can rent hearses. Sure, sure. There are people who, uh, who provide uh, livery, livery uh, in, the, in okay. the form of a hearse, okay. transportation. Okay. Yeah. So the answer to your question, if that's what you're getting at, could I'm one do it, it on I'm, the, I'm reading about <coughs> green funerals. Okay. Yes. I'm reading about okay. people who are taking more of the responsibility for the disposition of the remains of their loved ones. And I'm asking these questions mm -hmm. because I'm okay. reading. And of course, years ago, funerals were conducted inside the home of the family. Right, and in some parts yeah. of the country, that trend is, is growing as yeah. well, to have the funerals in the home. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, is it illegal? I'm not sure black people would do that. Uh, well, I, I don't mean me, to be funny. Well, I'm not trying to be funny. But well, no, you know I'm what? Open to that. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. I, I go back a long way. Years ago, wakes were held in the home. Mm -hmm. The deceased was, at, was yeah. brought home and put in the living room. And everybody came and they sat there. Now, I was told all the different reasons for this. One of the reasons was that they wanted to be certain that the deceased was in fact deceased. So the wake was that they sat up all night. It was not seven to nine and seven to eight. It was, they sat up all night with the body. Now I'm told by the, I'm from the South, and these were stories that I was told, that that was one of the reasons why they brought the body home, they sat up all night and they, they monitored and they, they, they tarried with the deceased, which is not a bad idea to tarry with the deceased. If I may add, that's, yes. that's what they do in Africa also. So there's a basis for that behavior that you described in the early days. Well, I think it was a south. carryover from our mm -hmm. tradition, African mm -hmm. tradition. We don't spend any time with our deceased. We go for the viewing once the body is prepared. We go to approve what the funeral home has done, and then we come, we don't want to see this. So then we come back to the, the wake, which is an hour or so, too, and we go through the, the funeral service or the home going service, as it's called, and then we go to the cemetery and have the burial. And many of us never return to the funeral to the uh, to the to the the burial site because it's such a painful experience and people don't want to be reminded they don't want to have to face it they don't want to have to grieve again they want to try to in some people's words to put it behind them or try to get over it and get past it and all of this kind of stuff so we don't tarry with the deceased we generally don't tarry with them when they are dying, you know, they can tell us we have to leave the, the room in intensive care. And they can say, you can only see this person every 15 minutes. And we go sit in the hall or go sit in the lounge and wait for the next 15 minutes. So we, we're losing a little bit of that African practice of tarrying and being there for the deceased and recognizing some things about the dying process. I think, Sable Murdy, it may be time for me to ask you to discuss some things about the bardo called death, the dying process. Yes. It's very interesting, and I think that it's something that us here in the West, um, we kind of shun away from. Actually, we don't understand death, what death is. And I think when you start with a wrong understanding 
a wrong perspective, you're not going to get the right meaning of what it is. And therefore, if you don't understand the meaning of death, dying, you can't understand the meaning of life. Because life is a continuum. It, it does not end. There's no opposite to life. And death is not the opposite of life. But here in the West, we have come to understand death as being the ending of life. And that has an effect on how you live your life when you proceed from that understanding and that perspective. Death, the opposite of death, is birth. Birth is the entrance. Death is the exit. The opposite of living is dying. The opposite of dead is alive. But life has no opposite. It's a continuum. You never, the life never ends. So there are after death experiences. And it's important to understand that because what we're talking about is a rite of passage. Funerals, weddings, inaugurations, all of these are rites of passage. So we need to understand, well, what is passing? What is the passage? What are these rites being performed for? And there are, the bardo is a, a word that's used that means an in-between state. That life is a continuum and that living is just a bardo. Death is a bardo. Birth is a bardo. And your life goes through the cycle of these events. And not understanding that has an a impact on your living, whereas you cannot fully mature as a human being. Because what exits at the time of death is the consciousness that is expressing itself through this body. That consciousness does not ever go out of existence. And it's interesting uh, that Ra brought up African tradition and the African tradition also the family includes the yet to be born, the living, and those who have passed on. So there's, it's not like when death has occurred, this person is gone and they no longer exist. There's an understanding in the African mind, in the African paradigm, that you never go out of existence. There is ancestral communion always taking place. And the disrespect and the dishonor and the disregard and the desacralization of what happened in the Burr Urk uh, scandal, that's something that can only happen yes. within a society that is disconnected from an understanding of culture, an understanding of right yeah. sacredness. Yeah. <clears throat> the spiritual base of human beings, the continuum of life. And so it's, it's really important that we take on the responsibility to make sure that as we are learning what life is and what death is, that we are acquiring the right perspectives of what it is. And many occasions, it's going to involve you going outside of your Western socialization and Western education because Western society has missed the mark in all of the areas that involve the maturation process of a human being. Yeah. Can I say yes. something? Because I, yeah, I think you hit the nail on, on the head. Uh, for example, only in a civilization, you're talking about having services at home in the living room and how that was done one time. And I, I didn't mean to be funny when I said that, that people are a little bit hesitant today to do that because now we've seen so many ghost stories, uh, movies, you know, in this culture, mm -hmm. you know, there's been so much Fear I, you know, fabrication associated, associated with associated, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now people, you know, some people... You know, we, when funeral directors they do this all the time, you go to a social outing and they find out your funeral director, they, they <laughs> act like they don't want to touch you right. as though you're tainted with death. And I am just use that as one example. 
Uh, a lot of people, the thought of bringing a deceased into their house, uh, you know, there's a sense, I suspect, deep down, I may be speculating to a certain extent, but I think uh, there's a lot of truth to this, and that is that, uh, you know, is there going to be a ghost? Or, you know, is, you know, there's the fear that uh, the whole mm -hmm. sacred thing, the whole, mm -hmm. the whole in depth, the, the knowledge about the cessation of life and what happens after death, it's been turned into a, a video rehash of what you've seen on TV, mm -hmm. and in what some people uh, 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 view as, you know, like like God sitting in heaven, you know, on the <laughs> throne looking down. I mean. You, it's not as literal, but sometimes the the behavior reflects that that is the understanding. But that is the understanding that's been sold to the people in our culture since the, the time of their birth. And if I may, I'm sorry if I may just go a little bit further. Mm -hmm. It's another reason why uh, this is a c capitalistic economy. Mm -hmm. It is a consumer-oriented society. You are only uh, or who you are has a lot to do with what you wear, where you live, what you drive, what you spend on. So from the very early, I mean, kids kill to for jeans and, and pants because, you know, jeans and shoes and jackets. And bling, and, bling, bling. Exactly. Bling. <laughs> because that, this society tells you that you're somebody to the extent you possess those. Mm -hmm. you know, that's totally far and away from uh, you go back to our roots that was that was that was never pushed to the extent it is today so and when we talk about tradition we're not we're talking about <coughs> western traditions yes we are because yeah. we are we're practicing western culture we become exactly. western and so <coughs> if we, every single um, rite of passage that he named you know wedding uh, funeral, every single one that you na he named, we are practicing Western traditions. Mm -hmm. I just went to a wedding recently, and the two individuals married. In the African tradition, families marry, not individuals. Mm -hmm. So it's the union of two families, and the two families have a vested interest in the success of this relationship. And so therefore, they're going to support that relationship. They're going to do all that they can to see that that relationship is solid and is maintained. When you have individuals marrying, then if their relationship does not make it as a as on the business side, because there's that side to a, a person. All relationships have at least those three sides, the business, the personal, and the spiritual. And so if, if the business end of that <laughs> relationship, that, that marriage, does not work, then you're going to have a relationship that's in trouble. If the personal end doesn't work, you're going to have a relationship. Right. And heaven help us if the spiritual end of the relationship doesn't work. So we're practicing Western traditions, and we spend a lot of money trying to attain and acquire these trinkets so that we can prove how Western we are, because that's the only proof you can give with acquiring Western trinkets is to, is to acquire what the commodities that the Western world produces. Yes. And once you have get, gotten certain brand names in your possession. A showy display yeah. or bling right. bling like mm -hmm. you said earlier. Mm -hmm. well, so that's we spend. a condition for being admired, for being, uh, uh, you know, held up. Uh, it's behind. validation. It's, yes. You know, yeah. who is going to say that you are somebody mm -hmm. if you don't have something for some evidence that you are somebody? Mm -hmm. So your evidence that you are somebody comes from how many of the trinkets pr produced in the Western world mm -hmm. you can acquire and, and, and maintain. But we need to, we need to get to deeper values, we need to get to sustainable values. Now this is the a age of sustainability. People are talking about the lifestyles that we live now are not sustainable. You simply cannot right. continue down this path of of, <laughs> of you really acquisition. You really hit the nail on the head on that one. Yeah, she's yeah. ringing somebody's bell. <laughs> you really, uh, this economy, uh, 
is currently going through a collapse uh, that is unprecedented in modern American history. And uh, the people who find themselves unemployed now, uh, the people who find themselves uh, buried more or less, man, funny I should use the word buried, but mm -hmm. uh, in this case a mountain of debt, mm -hmm. and you know, struggling uh, to make ends meet. Uh, I, I call it uh, this, these times the end of an era, mm -hmm. because we've just gone through a period of just unprecedented consumption. Mm -hmm. And now that the party's over, you know, you've gone through the hangover phase, mm -hmm. and credit is being withdrawn, uh, jobs are hard to find, people are forced to uh, retrench, which really brings home this issue you started out with about funerals, because mm -hmm. um, with limited resources, and I'll go so far as to say vastly limited, the ability to give the kind of a funeral, the traditional funeral uh, that we spoke about before has, has, has changed. Mm -hmm. and, and we're seeing that in the, the, the way the firms operate and the decisions that families are really forced to make. And it's having an impact on the average cost of a funeral. Even the major conglomerates or corporations who uh, raise their monies by selling stock, you know, on Wall Street, the, mm -hmm. the, the corporate facilities, uh, they've been going through a, a trend which has got to be approaching a decade now of de decreased revenues or, or you know, uh, people unable to spend in uh, the kind of pattern they had in the past. So. Um, to just sum it all up in one word is th the the party really is over mm -hmm. and people have got to be more practical and uh, I'll stop there. I don't want to let somebody else Monica's say something. Monica's amening everybody yeah. <laughs> but I know you have some thoughts of your own. I just really I was just really listening to the brother over here when he used the word disconnect I mean that just really resounded with me because I know in our culture of America and it's a death averse culture and it, there is a serious disconnection there in fact if you want to know anything about a people a group of people or a society you know look at the way they treat their dead mm -hmm. you know and it's where it was just yeah. really horrific you know that the families had to experience the baroque those with burials mm -hmm. in baroque mm -hmm. you know had to uh, experience that i just think that is just so unfortunate and i'm just so hopeful that it will never happen again because we were like Nobody really knew what to do and, you know, where we're going to have to store the bodies that are going to be buried there if you can't yeah. get into the cemetery. I mean, there were just so many issues. And um, one of my mortuary uh, uh, schools, uh, was uh, somebody from the mortuary school where I attended said, well, maybe it's a good thing we don't know what to do because that means it never happened before. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm just, my thoughts is hopefully, I'm just looking forward to the day when we can put this behind us and just make better decisions, you know, going forward. And, well, I want to tell you uh, that it, it, it has been my experience um, that cemeteries were owned by churches. In fact, um, in the South, that was almost always the case. Um, my family um, has um, land in Mississippi. Okay. Uh, the family built the church the family built the cemetery. And if you go into the cemetery, everybody who's buried in the cemetery is a member of that community, either a family member with the same surname or someone who, you know, who lived in the community as part of the family, part of the so-called extended family, although we don't use that term. But the whole point was that Cemeteries were not corporations. They were family owned. They were owned by the people who put up the church, who put up the cemetery. They were tended, the cemeteries were tended. My first cousin is still tending one of the attendants of the cemetery that uh, my family members are buried in. That cemetery has been there since, I guess, the early, uh, about 18, 18, very, uh, maybe, a, lot of history yeah, there. a long, long time ago when we can go there 
and be told, you know, this is your great, great, great grandmother. You know, you can see family, the, the, um, the monuments to the various family members. I'm wondering why now that we're talking about, and I heard this today, uh, that now Baroque is going into receivership and some money has been set aside to pay the receiver to manage this, this secretary. <coughs> Why, why not, uh, why are not the churches getting themselves involved in cemetery ownership? Why are these cemeteries owned by all these people who are not part of the community and may not feel the emotions that the community feels when they find that their loved ones have the, 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 um, the resting places of their loved ones have been desecrated. It would seem to me that it, it would be a natural thing for the institutions of our community to be all community controlled. And certainly churches would be among the first people that I would think that would have resources through the the tithes and offerings coming in from the community to go into such an enterprise. Is that rhetorical too? No, I, I don't. I don't think so. I think, uh, from a, a practical standpoint, you know, we're in an urban setting, uh, which is different from rural. Rural, there is generally land available. In an urban setting, uh, rural, you take all the vacant lots on the west side, and I think the going price now is still, you know, it's up to like a million dollars now with the land speculation and what have you. Mm -hmm. um, the ordinances uh, prevent you from. Uh, bearing, uh, but the there's a cemetery going into receivership. In Burl the case, in the case is of going Burl. into receivership, why mm -hmm. not have a an existing institution such as mm -hmm. a church or a group of churches become the people who are the caretakers, the caretakers, and the the receivers, or whatever you whatever. What does it take to get a cemetery? How does number, a cemetery come Number one, come into being? Uh, in evaluating uh, Burr Oak for an acquisition, let's say, to, uh, to operate a cemetery, there has to be some kind of assessment as to the number of available spaces. Do you want to buy a cemetery if you only got 10 spaces? Or is a cemetery more attractive if you have thousands of spaces available? So there needs to be some kind of assessment. And as best I understand right now, uh, there is actually some doubt as to the amount of available space. So from the standpoint of a prospective buyer, it would be uneconomical. You'd be basically buying a place you, uh, whose sole charge would be burying people who already own graves there or either paying operating costs, you know, cutting grass and, you know, et cetera. You follow me? I do Maintenance. follow you. So no revenue. All no right, revenue. so now you drive me to my next position because I always have a contingency plan. Good. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> if, Good for you. <laughs> if, 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 the, if the churches, if it is not financially feasible to acquire the cemetery as a business proposition, then I would think that the state ought to make the cemetery available to the community that it ser has traditionally serviced and it shouldn't have to be a business. Except the state of Illinois is bankrupt. So <laughs> the state doesn't want to own Burr Oak either. And I, when I use the term bankrupt, I'm being sort of facetious, but uh, if you've been following Pat Quinn's uh, have, ongoing battles, you know okay. the situation. Okay. And the state is in, in dire economic shape, okay. just like most households, uh, not only in Chicago or in Illinois, but all across the country. Um, this, the, this collapse, uh, I, I mean, was really severe, and maybe that's the topic of, a, of another show. Okay. But it, it shows you, in the case of Burrow, the, the best thing I can imagine is that it be turned into, and, and this is only, these are my thoughts, some kind of a monument, uh, you know, uh, some kind of a hollow ground, because I seriously don't think there's enough space available to have an ongoing cemetery operation. So what do you have? Do you have a burial museum? Do you follow me? Right. Uh, is it owned and operated by a foundation? Uh, 
don't I don't expect the state to be persuaded very easily to come forward with the funds to support its ongoing okay. care. Okay. Although I do recognize it as an opportune time because you've got candidates running for political office okay. who desperately need the African American vote okay. and are not willing to do something that might offend. So there's a you can kind of there's some political arm twisting I would imagine that's that's possible on behalf of Baroque, uh, when in a non-election year, just might be, you know, kind of mm -hmm. ignored. Right. But you know. see, it, it, we must realize that all of us will need a final resting place. May I say one other thing yes. to that point? Uh, you know, we were talking about burying down. You could always bury up. You could mm -hmm. build, you know, mausoleums and mm -hmm. uh, structures like that. But that only adds to the uh, the cost. But okay. you know the borough could be where there's a lack of space with mausoleums and crypts and things like that. They can be built, but then it takes money to to do that. Well, I think that you know I pay some pretty fair taxes, <coughs> and and a lot of us do. Whether we pay them from from salary or wages or pension or whatever they come from. Uh, you, we're paying sales taxes, we're paying retail sales taxes and other kinds, so we're all paying some sort of taxes. If we're spending money, we are paying some sort of taxes. Every single one of us is going to ultimately need a final resting place. It ought to be a right to expect there to be a final resting place for every person who lives presently and who, who will live in the future. It should, there should be no such thing as a finite amount of space to bury people when everyone is going to die. It is ridiculous to say that, you know, you, you have this plot of land, okay, that's all the people we can bury here, okay, well then you figure out, you know, Mr. Representative, Mr. Senator, Mr. President, you figure out what we do, what we should expect to have as a final resting place. Because I think Reverend Meeks made the, made the comment that all cemeteries are finite space, have finite space. You cannot expect any cemetery to be able to bury in single plots forever because they simply will run out of space. So where is the forethought on the part of the people who run the government about what is to be done with the remains of people who will need a final resting place? It ought not, we ought not to have to figure that out. And we ought not to have to worry about what will become of a cemetery that has reached its capacity and we have buried our children and our parents and our our relatives and friends there. I went up, when uh, my daughter's birthday came, I couldn't go to, to Burroughs, as is, is my custom, to put flowers on her grave. I had to go to my mother, who was in another cemetery, to pay tribute to my daughter because the gates to Burroughs are locked. These kinds of things should not happen. You should not ever be, there should never be a barrier between, <laughs> between the living, the dead, and the unborn. There should never be a locked gate with a closed sign across mm -hmm. it. That's, is that, what is that? Is that sacrilegious? Yes, it is. It's unheard of in a civilized community. In Africa, you would never find such a thing. You would never find the separation of the, of the living, the dead, and the unborn. It just, it's unthinkable. So much of what is being done at this time in this culture is so, so customary, so ordinary, so common that we don't think that it is outrageous. I started to say outrageous, but I didn't want to get ahead. <laughs> well, I was say outrageous. I was thinking that. I was following you. Okay. When the, w there, at one point, the indigenous people in the Dakotas 
Gold was found in the Black Hills of the Dakotas. And so the, the, uh, the prospectors went in en masse and they started digging up the graves, panning for gold. The indigenous people went on what they called the war path because they were insulted, they were offended, they were outraged that their ancestors had been disturbed. We went to the cemetery, we all stood around, we walked around, we looked around, we tried to see what, if we could discern whether or not there had been disturbance here or there, what have you. But by and large, except for people who had relatives buried in that cemetery, we did not see that as, a commun as an insult mm -hmm. to the entire community because if it could happen there, it could happen anywhere, and probably was. That's that individual mindset operating because there is no I am because we are, because we are, therefore I am. We define ourselves individually. Again, the, that disconnectedness Disconnect. that's obviously <clears throat> seen. There's no outrage. A lot of people are looking at it like, oh, you know, those families are suffering. All of us are suffering. If there's a real understanding of our connectedness, there's no way that you can separate yourself and say that those families are suffering. I'm, I'm glad I don't have any family members in Burr Oak. And I've heard some people actually say that. So the, the disconnection is there. And if I can add a, another spiritual footnote to this whole mm -hmm. subject of uh, of death, early as we were speaking about how we're acquiring all these possessions, material things, and the society, it promotes that. And we feel like we're yes. connected when we have these things with the society that we're growing up in. But yet we know that we cannot take any of those things with us. And as I said earlier, if life is a continuum and there are after death experiences, then we need to find out while we're still on this side what it is that we can do that can help and aid us in those after death experiences. And one of the things that we can do now is learn how to meditate because the consciousness that's expressing itself during this bardo of living, that consciousness continues as life and meditation is about the discipline of attention, which helps you to gain access to finer knowledges and finer experiences of the life that's expressing itself. And as you do that, that goes with you. Since your life continues, consciousness still exists. The benefits that you acquire from meditation can aid you in the after death experiences. And this is something that you find in all of the ancient traditions, in the ancient world, the, uh, the whole book misnomer as the, ancient, uh, uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is really the Per Em Heru, the book of coming forth by light, coming into the, the day, and even the Tibetan Book of the Dead. These are spiritual instructions for the consciousness that's entering to the bardo that's beyond the living. And much of that involves disciplining your attention through practices of meditation. And this is something that we need to learn how to do so that in the continuum of life, the benefits that we're supposed to be receiving during our living, if we do not get them here, we can be afforded that benefit <clears throat> through our meditation practice in the afterlife. This is something that we're not educated to understand anything about. If you don't have uh, some familiarity within your own knowledge base, what I'm saying is going to sound very foreign because we, we don't have nothing to grapple with in terms of, of our ideas and concepts with any kind of after death experiences. And I say after death instead of after life because there's no afterlife. Life is never after or before. There's never a time when life doesn't exist. exists. But death is just the exit of consciousness expressing itself through this body in this living bardo and that after death experiences and meditation 
through the discipline of attention affords us benefits that we can regain rewards in those after death experiences. And that's what we need to be trying to invest so much time, energy and attention in while we're living. And it betters the quality of our living also because everything that we experience come through our attention. And if it is not disciplined, then the whole quality of our life is going to follow that undisciplined attention. We'll make bad decisions. We'll make bad choices. Things that are improper when I'm using the word bad. Things that are improper that really oh, impede sorry. our growth yeah. psychologically and spiritually and emotionally. <coughs> because physically we don't have to do much to mature. But psychologically and emotionally and spiritually, it involves our conscious participation. So we have to do much to mature on those levels. And many of us are not really being rightly enculturated and educated to, to do all of that. We're not even valuing it. It's not a value in this society. And that's a travesty because there's much regret in the life of people who enter into the dying bar though, because they look back over their lives and they see how much time they have wasted how much they have just misused their lives. And there's, there's lots of regrets. And we don't have to go through those regrets. We can take care of all of that now and not have to be sad and suffering in our dying and feel that as a loss that's something that was wasted. I'm glad we ended on this note because I wanted us to have something to look forward to. I know that you have, you give lectures, you give workshops, and I'm glad that you do because people who want to know more about it, of course, can, can take part in those. And I'm very happy that you came, Mr. A, as I call <laughs> you, uh, the funeral director who, who has more concerns than just the the business aspect. I can't wait to get your tape because when you play it back, you gave one of the most eloquent arguments for cremation I've ever heard. Oh, all right. Okay. <laughs> all right, and I want to thank you again, Monica, for coming to join Thanks us. Thanks for inviting me. I just want to say what the Illinois Funeral Directors, I'm our district two-way secretary in, in my region. All right, thank and you. And an expert on cremation. <laughs> and an expert on cremation. We didn't even didn't get there. That far. We didn't touch that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. We do. We have been discussing. Well, that. you know, we may have to have a conversation around this because cremation is a scary subject too. You know, it's it's one of those views with fear. So we we may have to have a discussion. About Absolutely. That. All right. Thank you so much, Saber Murti, Juanie Gentry. Thank you so much. Did you enjoy yourself? Yeah. I did.